Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Tuesday, the 19th of December, 2023. Happy holidays. Good to have you on board, as always, everybody. Today's show is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. Since 1873, our members have provided the foundation for everything we do, from this show to Proceedings and Naval History to USNI Press books to events and conferences and news Members receive Proceedings Magazine, print and digital or digital only, and big discounts on Naval Institute press books and invitations to member-only events. To become a member of the Institute, go to usni forward slash, I'm sorry, usni.org forward slash join and use our holiday code, HOLLY23, to get $10 off today. Uh, now to introduce my guest, Joining me from Newport, Rhode Island and the Naval War College is Navy Commander Anthony Lavopa. He's one of the co-authors of the December Proceedings article titled, It's All About Sea Control, which is one of the five American Sea Power Project Phase Three articles in the December issue that address the War of 2026 scenario. Anthony is joining us from Newport, where he's a student at the Naval War College, and he uh, has, I think he's been screened to uh, to take command of our XO and CO of a destroyer or, or a surface ship. So congrats on all that, Anthony. Congrats on uh, writing for us and for uh, being a student at the War College and for your uh, screening for command. That's great news. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. I was so uh, proud to be part of the American Sea Power Project. And uh, yeah, looking forward to talking a little bit more about the article. Uh, so take a minute, tell our listeners a bit about your background, and then uh, talk about your co-author, Scott Tate. We don't have him on the show, but this article was written by you and Captain Scott Tate, who's now uh, retired from the Navy. Yeah, so I started my Navy journey back in 2009. I, came, I uh, graduated from Virginia Tech with my bachelor's in civil engineering and a minor in leadership. I uh, went to Norfolk, uh, to, did two division officer tours there on USS Porter, uh, DDG 78. From there, went to teach ROTC in uh, New Jersey at uh, Rutgers and then stood up the unit, uh, our Crosstown unit at uh, Princeton. Uh, from there, department head school, did my first department head tour on board uh, DDG 1000 and commissioned her as a weapons officer, combat systems officer, and then went to uh, the good ship America's Battle Cruiser USS Leyte Golf CG 55 and did uh, my second department head tour there uh, where I screened for 04 Command. Uh, so leaving the cruiser, went to take command of USS Hurricane PC-3, forward deployed in Bahrain. And then uh, after that, went to the Pentagon, uh, went to the, the SWO Mecca N-96 OPNAV requirements and uh, did some requirements for about a year and a half. And uh, now I'm here as a Halsey Alpha Fellow uh, at the War College and uh, slated for XOCO of USS Bulkley DDG-84 in Rota starting in early 2025. Wow, so you get to go to the FDNF in Rhoda, uh, and uh, those ships are all in I the do. news right now. I know Kearney is one of those ships, and so everything that's happening in the Eastern Med and the Red Sea is uh, uh, re much of it revolving around you know the Ford and the Eisenhower strike groups, but also uh, the Rhoda-based destroyers that are uh, doing a lot of that protection, protective work in the Red Sea and the, and the, the Eastern Med right now, so exciting. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but if you uh, were commissioned in 2009 and it's now 2023, that's a, you've been moving pretty quickly in your career path. Yeah, it, it's been a great career. I've had a lot of great opportunities. I mean, command certainly has been the pinnacle so far. Uh, and I feel this answer the second part of your question, which is how Scott Tate and I got involved. Uh, he was my XO and then took command of DDG 1000. So uh, by far the toughest boss that I've ever worked for. Uh, but he's been a, a really good mentor for me, um, and uh, especially post Navy. Um, but he, I would say, was one of the first CEOs that really helped to start changing uh, the way that I think, uh, the way that I think tactically, the way that I think about larger operational strategic issues. Uh, so, uh, and he also got me in contact uh, with Jim Fitzsimons as a as a young department head and uh, told me start talking to Jim, absorb everything I can. And so now I'm even more excited to be here as part of the, the Halsey Alpha program. Yeah, you broke up a little bit there. I'll repeat that last bit for our listeners who aren't aware. Jim Fitzsimons is a 
retired Navy captain. He's on the faculty up at uh, the Naval War College, and he runs a uh, a very uh, specialized uh, war gaming team called the Halsey Alpha Group. And uh, Anthony is part of that group, which, uh, uh, you know, it, it does um, it does war gaming that I think would make uh, Chester Nimitz and Raymond Spruance and, and Ernest J. King very proud uh, that that kind of war gaming at that level of detail uh, is happening. And, and I, I've known a number of officers who've gone through that program and uh, emerged from it uh, feeling like their brain had expanded two or three times in that in that uh, you know learning opportunity. So it's not just about being a student at the War College, but also being part of that that war gaming group while you're there is an uh, incredibly expansive uh, opportunity. And uh, so also for our listeners who are not surface warfare officers who or maybe aren't familiar with the DDG-1000, that's the USS Zumwalt, the lead of the three-ship class of uh, stealthy um, destroyers, really, but in, in size, uh, those are really cruiser-type you know, type ships, uh, cruiser, you know, battle cruiser, almost, uh, classification ships, uh, and, and, you know, armed to the teeth, uh, and and uh, so so you got a chance to be one of the uh, early crew members of the of the first of that class. So that and, and that and I think that experience influenced uh, this article from both you and and Scott because there's quite a bit about the Zumwalts and some specific capabilities that, that they might bring to this uh, scenario. So uh, great stuff. Um, so for our viewers and listeners who maybe haven't had a chance to read the scenario, let me just recap real quickly. It's a China-Taiwan scenario set in 2026. Uh, the, we're about a month, as, as you read the scenario, uh, a month of the conflict has gone by and China has seized Taiwan's offshore islands, put a large landing force ashore in southern Taiwan. Uh, Chinese missile forces have engaged U.S. forces in Japan uh, quite hard including the forward deployed naval forces. Uh, the, the FDNF carrier uh, has been sunk in this uh, case. Other ships have taken a lot of uh, damage. And the U.S. Navy uh, has had to sort of fall back and regroup to the east of the second island chain. So that's kind of where we left the authors that we asked to write this uh, first series of maybe 10 articles that are in the December issue and more coming, four more coming in the uh, January issue. And we'll probably have a couple more coming in the February issue. And, and so, Anthony, your article states, I'll just quote this here, early losses in this scenario result from the surface Navy having failed to effectively adapt in peacetime to changes in technology and operating concepts and over-reliance on exquisite and expensive but low quantity and relatively short range capability. So there's a lot to unpack, uh, unpack in that, but just, you know, sort of hit the highlights of those major points that you and, uh, and Scott made about the surface Navy. You know, I think it's been a challenging few years for the Navy. I mean, Fitzgerald and McCain are still, are still well within, uh, you know, our, our review mirror, uh, Bonhomme or Shard. Certainly, you know, so we've kind of moved past that. And, and it's interesting you ask, because I, I just reread the first few parts of Trent Hone's um, book on Nimitz and his war in the Pacific. And he talks about the morale being so low, uh, not that the surface warfare morale is low, uh, but certainly we're at a point where we, we, we need to start moving in a direction um, together. Um, the training, I think, that we've implemented over the past few years is definitely helping the quality of division officers that I see from my perspective coming out to the fleet uh, from a ship driving and a war fighting perspective seem to be better. Um, I think, um, you know, Mahan talks about uh, one, of, one of the things he talks about it is uh, naval officers needing an artistic sensibility in a, in a time of war uh, to be able to think and make decisions quickly uh, without necessarily having to do a lot of, you know, what I would call mother may I. And so we've got a transition period as the surface Navy that I, I think maybe we missed a little bit uh, in in the post-Soviet Union, you know, time. We've, we've spent a lot of time launching T-Lands, doing some counter piracy, things that are very prescripted. And what I would sort of call like a Beethoven's very classical style music where everybody's, you know, getting direction and paying attention. And we kind of need to move to an Art Blakey, like jazz style 
you know, where everybody has a general sense of what's going on, but we're not we're not looking at one person to direct the band. Everyone knows their their part and how they play and, and is expected to, to, you know, execute some initiative. So I think it's a transition that's happening. Um, you know, we can argue about timelines and I, I don't necessarily want to get into that, but I, I think the faster uh, we can make that transition as a community, the better. Yeah, no, that, I think those are really good points. And and I, I've met a number of midshipmen at the academy who are, you know, service selecting, uh, surface warfare, are very excited about it, impressive young people. And so I agree with you from my perspective, you know, looking at who is heading to the surface Navy now and their excitement for it, at least out of one of the big commissioning sources, it, it uh, I think I think things are uh, are, are going well. Uh, but there's a lot of work to be done, as you point out, you know, uh, so it, it, in the last six years, you know, sort of bouncing back from the collisions of 2017 and then the Bonham Richard fire three years ago. And, um, it, you know, and there was a, a period where we're still pay the Navy is still paying for the fact that during OEF and OIF, there was a lot of underinvestment, quite frankly, in uh, naval capabilities while our adversaries, particularly the Chinese, were investing in advanced capabilities. And, and so there's some catch up ball to, to be played. Um, so you and Scott, uh, Captain Tate, draw on Alfred Thayer Mahan and other navalist writings about the importance of sea control at the global control of oceanic movement, I think is how you quoted in your, in your article, as a fun foundational fundamental principle for the Navy. So talk about how that applies to the scenario, this War of 2026 scenario, and what surface forces will need to do next to control that global oceanic movement. Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, my, my again, the, the opinions I share are just mine. I'm, I'm not advocating for an opinion of the Navy. I, I really think there's, there's three things that we try to articulate in the article. One is... Um, defining command. And again, I go back to Trent's book on, on Nimitz, and that's one thing that he spent arguably the first few months of 1942 trying to do was help the staff and, and, and the commanders in the Pacific define exactly what that meant. He had the advantage, and, and they talk about it in the book, of you know having been the then equivalent of, of PERS, of putting the right people in the right place at the right time. Uh, and I think that's an interesting concept because that's very counter in some ways to the detailing um, processes that we do now. Uh, you know, we use timelines for individuals, not timelines for operational or strategic issues. And so I think it would be interesting to kind of look at things through that lens. In other words, a guy like me, Halsey Alpha grad, fo focused on the Western Pacific academically, is going to Rota to command a ship. Certainly, you know, we are a global Navy. We can go anywhere. Um, but using Nimitz's his his uh, thought process, that that may not be the best place for me to go. Uh, so I think that was one thing that was in our background. The second is, you know, the classic Wayne Hughes fire effectively first and whether it's sea control or sea denial, um, you know, the the seizing of the initiative, I, I think, is important. Uh, certainly in this scenario, we, we had not seized the initiative. Right. We are we are working to fight our way back. Um, but that doesn't mean that at the tactical level or the operational level, there are not opportunities to seize that sea denial or sea control opportunity uh, in, in the scenario. And I, I think we we try to uh, approach that from, from a how, how would we do that method as, as we kind of fight our way west um, throughout the article. Uh, and, and then the third thing in the article was we were trying to not just focus on the surface fleet, but rather the surface domain as a whole. And I think when you look at the surface domain rather than just the surface fleet, it's a little bit more eye opening. You know, the Marine Corps and the Army right now are doing some incredible things with land based missiles, land based anti ship missiles. And so I don't think that's something that could be discounted. Certainly, the Air Force has a capability to provide anti ship missiles uh, from some of their platforms. Um, so, and, and Sino Greener talked about this, I think it was a 2012 proceedings article where we need to decouple the platforms from the weapons and sensors. And I, and I think particularly in the surface force, but I, I can, I think from a, a wider Navy perspective, we have a love affair with platforms. We love platforms, DDGs, F-35, CBN-78, 
But what we really need is a better focus on the sensors that allow us to, to look faster, farther, and first, and then weapons paired with those sensors that allow us to shoot first and, you know, kind of have the old, uh, you know, uh, some, some people on here may be old enough to remember the Ronco style, you know, set it and forget it, right? That's what we need, a missile that we can shoot and we don't have to do anything as the ship. It's a fire and forget and it, it knows where it's going. Um, and, and I think we kind of need to, to move towards that um, to increase our lethality. And then finally, you know, we need to start thinking outside of the box. You know, Clausewitz would, would say something along the lines of, um, you know, prevent bad intellectual habits from, from determining strategic courses of action. And so we need to purge a lot of time that we've spent as surface warfare officers fighting the ship a particular way. And we really need to, I think, come up on plane a little bit faster in, in newer, uh, more practical ways to fight the ship that incorporate new technology and then taking that technology to mold the tactics. Yeah, you make some good points there. And I just wanted to um, pull, pull a thread on a couple of them because in previews of coming attractions, little spoiler alert here for the January proceedings, which we just finished. Uh, so um, we have Admiral Scott Swift, former PAC fleet commander, He's written an article that will be in the January issue on command and control. Uh, and back to your point about um, you didn't use the term mission command, but he uses the term mission command, uh, at which very much kind of gets away from, you know, that sort of Beethoven style symphony where everybody can see the conductor uh, perfectly well. Right. And you're all playing from the same sheet of music to more of that ability to understand where are we going? Um, without being prescriptive about how we get there. And so that mission command, uh, you know, delegating authority, delegating mission down to the lowest possible uh, level uh, is very much in, in Admiral Swift's article. Uh, and then to your point about, you know, Wayne Hughes and firing effectively first, and, you know, that gets at some other things that are, you know, have been in proceedings, not necessarily sometimes part of this American Sea Power Project, but, you know, this payloads over platforms, the sensors, distributed sensors, and where it, it, it perhaps doesn't matter who fires the weapon, right? Who has the sensor, who finds the, you know, the adversary, and then where the where the weapon comes from. It could be from a, a ground-launched uh, Tomahawk, or Tomahawk uh, anti-ship missile fired by an army battery or fired by, you know, a naval strike missile from the Marine Corps, from an EAB or from a B-1. And, and so that idea of not just surface warfare in the U.S. Navy, but, but anti-surface warfare as a team sport very much starts to come out of this whole series of articles. Uh, and so they, uh, you, you bring up some really good points there. Um, you, you know, one of the things that uh, you and Scott talk about in the article is about the PLA Navy's center of gravity in this fight. You know, so I, when we, uh, as, a, as an editorial staff, read that first, we were like, okay, are they talking about the Chinese center of gravity, the PLA center of gravity, or the Navy center of gravity? And you were really focused on the PLA Navy center of gravity. You know, so what is that in your minds in this scenario? And, you know, how does the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps, or maybe the Joint Force, get after that? Yeah, so I, I again, I think it's a surface domain uh, is where we look at it, and it's really two pieces. One, one is the PLA rocket force. Certainly the Chinese land-based anti-ship missile capability has to be acknowledged, recognized, and respected. So that's the first part. And then the combatants that the PLA and puts to sea are incredibly uh, well-armed um, with some really capable long-range missiles. Uh, and so if we're stacking up, you know, their Navy against our Navy, which is what people often want to do, I don't know that I want to make that comparison. I'd rather look at their ability to project power and conduct sea control in the surface domain and compare our surface domain picture to include the Army and the Marine Corps, right, the J and Joint. Um, and, and how do we as a surface Navy or surface domain fight that in um, in combination with our um, our other services, but also what, what our allies and partners have to contribute. And, and there's a piece to that. Um, so I, I think it's really those two things, the rocket force plus the maritime capability that the Chinese can put to sea 
Um, and, and how do we counter that in the surface domain? I think it's it's some of our Navy. It's it's some of our joint capability that the Army and the Marine Corps are certainly building out. And then there's some partners and allies, that I think, that, that also can contribute to that. Yeah. And that um, that echoes with uh, an, an art, the article by Captain Bill Toady, retired Captain Bill Toady on, on the submarine warfare domain. Right. And one of the things he points out in that is that U.S. Navy submarines, uh, attack submarines that are forward in this scenario uh, would not be doing what U.S. submarines have mainly focused on for the last 30, 40 years, which is anti-submarine warfare. So they are, you know, incredibly talented and uh, and capable in hunting adversary submarines. But in this case, Bill Toady points out that our submarines will actually have to hunt surface ships. So their biggest, um, you know, focus in this scenario would be actually trying to sink uh, Chinese surface combatants and also the... the uh, uh, Chinese uh, shipping that's moving the landing force across the Taiwan Strait. So that gets to your point also about, you know, in the surface domain, it's not just about surface on surface ships. It's about all the different capabilities that you can array against the, you know, the sea control problem or sea denial problem. Um, we, we touched on this already, but uh, I want to I want to get to you know, because your article talks about the Zumwalt class three ships. So it's not, you know, that's a high demand, low density, but very, you know, particularly, uh, you know, capable asset. Um, but talk first about some of the advantages and disadvantages that the U.S. Navy has in this scenario, particularly the surface fleet. And then this, some of the recommendations that you and Captain Toady, or, or sorry, Captain Tate have for, um, you know, sort of turning those advantages around a bit. Yeah, so you know some of the disadvantages I think we've already talked about from the surface fleet perspective. Again, Anthony's perspective, I, I think it's you know we are we are out outsticked. Um, the the Chinese have missiles that go farther and faster uh, than ours do, and, and there's just, there's just a simple physics problem there uh, that I think we need to solve. Now I say that it's simple, but also in the back of my mind, my requirements brain is churning and saying that it's not that simple, or or perhaps we would have solved it. Um, at this point, but I, but I think that is probably um, the Achilles heel for us as a surface Navy is um, having those long range uh, precision strike weapons, whether it's, you know, precision strike land, precision strike maritime to go forth and, and use in a power projection way uh, to, again, affect sea control and sea denial, depending on what type or what, what we're, what effects we're trying to achieve uh, for for what operational purpose? I'd say the other you know the other piece I think that's an advantage for the surface navy is the people, right? And you alluded to it earlier. There are some incredibly talented people coming into the surface warfare community. It's no longer you know the aviation and submarine attrition uh, recruiting program that it was a while back. Um, you know, midshipmen are wanting to go. Uh, surface and they should and they should be excited about that because the community has a lot of great things to offer and we have a lot of great technology and we do get to do a lot of cool things like drive cool ships and and um, and whatnot um, but I think sometimes we often overplay the people thing a little bit as the silver bullet and that the people can make up the gaps in technology and capability um, that, that again, as you pointed out earlier, we, we kind of allowed to happen in the early 2000s. Um, I'm confident in the department heads that I see going to see. I have two in school right now, and one that just graduated, and I will tell them that they are hands down further ahead than where I was in terms of their thinking as a department head when I when I graduated department head school um, in 2016. So I, I think we need to keep the press on and keep the focus on the people um, because people is really what develops the tactics, right? And we're, and uh, I, f I forgot who said who said it, but we're going to go to war with what we have now, not you know what we hope we have at the end of another two or three you know perfectly executed fit ups. Um, and, and so, if we're going to war with what we have, that means we need good, intelligent people that can think outside the box to help develop these tactics, and they've got to be done at the ship level. Right. Smittick is doing some great things in San Diego and they've produced some really great tactical bulletins and tactical memos. But there needs to be more learning um, 
at the ship level, more tactic development at the ship level. And those lessons need to get fed out to the fleet of here's what we found. We didn't we didn't write a 25 page instruction. Here's kind of a one page summary. Go. Um, and, and I think, again, as I as I read and reread Trent's book on Nimitz, those kind of lessons learned um, it is what helped create the advantage for us um, in in the 1942 time frame, right? We could we could think faster because we were relying on ship captains to go out and develop tactics and and report back and kind of spread, you know, do the captain thing and walk around and talk to other captains and say, hey, here's what I here's what I found out. Uh, they they weren't waiting for Nimitz or his staff to send out guidance, um, and so I think that's probably the transition point that we're at now um, as a community. The the last thing I would say is. You know, there's there's two T's in TTP and everyone normally focuses on technique, which is what I would call system setup. Right. The P is procedures, PPRs, et cetera. But the T that we really need to focus on is the tactics. You know, it's clear to me that our JOs and our department heads have the technical understanding of how Aegis works and, and the nuances of it. We've done a great job educating people that way, but we need to take that technical understanding and help transition that into meaningful new tactics, uh, which is part of what we alluded to in the article with the standing up of the innovation cell and combining the really technical rigor that and, and academia that NPS has with the war fighting, uh, war fighting centric um, mindset of the war college and trying to fuse those two to really help narrow down what things do we need and what and what tactics are we developing that are, are frankly just chaff and kind of just taking up too much, too much bandwidth. Yeah, um, I, I was thinking during that your your last answer there. I was uh, reminded of conversations over the last couple of years with a number of uh, weapons and tactics instructors. So the WTIs and you know the the surface warfare, particularly the surface warfare WTIs. Um, and, and I'm just curious from your perspective, I don't know if you are a WTI, uh, if you've been through that school, but, you know, you, I would imagine that, that that cadre would would play into what you just said about developing tactics, right, and, and promulgating those tactics across the fleet quickly. It, it does. I, I'm not a WTI. I, I was going to, and then I, went, I chose to go to command instead. Um, and and I, I think there is a piece for, for that to play, right? But I, but um, at the end of the day, right, ship CEOs and department heads that are at sea, in my opinion, are responsible for helping develop those tactics. Sminig is a great organization, but it's a staff, right? And if we as the warfighters are waiting on the staff to, to give us guidance and tell us what to do, I think we have it backwards. Um, every single time ships go to sea, they should be trying something new, trying some new tactic or, or put the weapon system in a different configuration to say, what if we do X? And then if it doesn't work, hey, one page email, exec sum, whatever, back to Sminic and, and the rest of your Desron and, and the, you know, the ships of your coast and say, hey, we tried this. It didn't work. We're going to try this next time. Right. And, and that's how that sort of quick agile learning happens that I think, you know, Gilday was really driving at uh, in, in terms of we need to we need to learn at the speed of relevant, I think is I probably misquoted him, but but something along those lines. Right. His. His innovative desire, I, I think, is best met at the tactical level, not not at the staff level. That's a good point. Um, so uh, let's get to some of the specific recommendations. So one of the things uh, that we asked the, the authors of all these American Sea Power Phase Three articles was uh, to look at this scenario, and we we put the scenario not in 2035, we put it in 2026 for a reason, which was. You know, near term, we are in what what it's been termed the Davidson window, the decade of maximum danger right now. Uh, and so if this war were to break out, if this scenario were to come true in the next two years or so, as you pointed out a few minutes ago, then it was uh, Secretary Rumsfeld who said, you know, you don't you go to war with the with the with the army you have or the military you have, not the one that you wish you had. And so that's very true in this scenario is. If you had to fight this scenario in 2026, it's going to be essentially the joint force that we have today with a few tweaks, but nothing is going to majorly change in the force structure of the U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, Joint Force, you know, in the next 
year or two years. Um, uh, so we asked the authors, we asked you guys to uh, to say, okay, so given this scenario, given the challenge that it, that it faces, that you face in it, um, what would you, if you were king, if you were SecDef, if you were the president, if you were Congress, what would you do right now to, to change the equation a little bit uh, in 2026? And so talk, talk maybe the, the top three that you and Scott thought were, okay, here's what we would absolutely do right now. Yeah, so the, so the first one I already alluded to a little bit was the innovation cell, right? That the War College has just an incredible, the Naval War College has just an incredible academic, um, it, it's an incredible academic institution for wargaming and war fighting. And the resident knowledge in many of the people that are there, both military and retired military, is, is I, I think, unparalleled in, in any other um, single building or campus in the Navy. And I would say the same is true of NPS. I, I'm not an NPS grad, um, but many of my my peers are, and I, I've been nothing but impressed with with much of the technical piece um, that NPS continues to to drive. And so I I think taking the best of both worlds, war fighting and technical, and putting it together in some type of small innovation cell that can quickly look at reports coming out of the fleet, uh, you know, develop some anal analytical rigor to um, the reports and, and how they should be adjudicated or, or define tactics. And then you've got, you know, a handful of post command commanders in there that can say with their experience fighting the ship, yes, this will work. No, it won't. And then that, that is a direct input to the SWO boss really in, in his or her hat as commander Naval Surface Forces Pacific. Uh, as, as a means to inform the PAC fleet and Indo-PACOM commanders of, hey, this is what we're doing. It didn't work. Now, now we're trying this um, in, in, a, in a way that, that gets to an operational advantage. Um, the, the second thing I, th I think is, is some of the things we talked about in the article, something as simple as you know, refitting airliners to be tankers, right? There just aren't enough tankers out there. Um, you know, many of the, the pointy nose jet guys that I, I talked to in Halsey, Hey, how many tankers would you like for this scenario? And the answer often is as many tankers as you can find me. Uh, and, and so that, so that's a challenge. Uh, but it's also a challenge for the surface Navy, right? The more ships we put to sea, the more fuel and gas and food and, and uh, you know, peanut butter and all the important things in life that we're going to need uh, to sustain ships at sea. And so um, can we refit or, or can we um, be proficient at going alongside a commercial oil tanker and, you know, filling the DDG up with gas. That's something I've never done in 15 years. I don't know anybody that's done it. Um, but those are the kind of things that we need to think about. And it needs to be outside the normal acquisition and fit up process, right? That, uh, pe people will often counter that to me with, well, yeah, but, you know, when, when the bombs fell on Pearl Harbor, or we, you know, Ford was churning out airplanes and tanks and all these things, except they forget about four or five years prior to bombs falling on World War, I'm sorry, on Pearl Harbor, was when much of that investment and transition for those companies actually happened in order to start supporting the war in Europe. And so if, if we're at that point, that means 2016 and 2017 should have been the years of transition where now, again, we'll just use Ford as the example, Ford is churning out F-35s and they're not. And so to your point, when we go to war with the military, we have the, you know, push the easy button of, hey, okay, Ford, time to turn out F-35s. That, that's not realistic. And so we need to think of things um, that are already in place. The airliners, one. Another is, is the Kratos UAV that we talked about and getting that thing produced in mass and getting it out uh, and, and how effective it can be. But again, this all hinges on can we start thinking differently about the problem or are we viewing the problem through the same you know, business as usual acquisition process uh, that, that's gotten us to where we are? Yeah, and I'll add uh, not not to be a a, a doomsayer, but uh, uh, we have to get beyond the uh, the conventional thinking that uh, has really sort of dominated the last thirty years, which is you know post Cold War uh, that the United States has you know the biggest, best, greatest military with all the best capabilities, um, you know. At, it, and my question is always when people will say that is, well, to do what, where, right? And so this scenario is an extreme away game for the United States 
uh, and it's a, an extreme home game for the Chinese. And they've built capabilities uh, very rapidly in the last 15 years designed for this scenario, where it's, the United States really has not, right? We, ha we have not been thinking until quite recently about the capabilities needed for this scenario. And we really haven't started building those capabilities in sufficient quantities yet. And so those, to your point, you know, Ford Motor Company and General Motors, they're not making F-35s yet. They're not making uh, l rasms right? They're not making the uh, sophisticated weapons that, that are needed in the quantities needed. And so, yeah, that's a, a great point. Um, we're, uh, we're running short on time here. One or two more uh, recommendations from your paper, things that, uh, how do you, I, I alluded to it earlier, uh, the Zumwalt's play a role in the way that you and, and Scott wrote your article. Uh, what what is the role that you have for them? How did you see um, from his his objective? Uh, sorry, I've got some sirens going on here. Uh, you know, Scott commanded Zumwalt. You were a department head on Zumwalt. Uh, how did how did you see those ships playing a particularly niche kind of role in this scenario? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, in my mind, Zumwalt is the is the ultimate ASUW surface platform that we have if we choose to use it in such a capacity. Um, you know, we in in the scenario we paired it with some JMFDF uh, submarines. An Australian uh, colleague of mine asked me why we didn't choose the Collins class. I, I'm not trying to exclude uh, Australia. We we were we were just focused on the JMSDF. Um, but but I but I think it it has its role to play, and it's it's not an early Burke. We shouldn't treat it like an Arleigh Burke, and therefore, um, it's got capabilities beyond what the Arleigh Burke can bring in terms of, um, uh, you know, weapons payload uh, and, and, and many other things beyond that. Uh, certainly, you know, the, there's a signature difference between the ships uh, in, in many domains, and so again, we we need to think out of the box, and we need to use those advantages that are already in place um, for for something that perhaps for an Arleigh Burke may be too high of a risk, maybe ALR high for an Arleigh Burke, but maybe it's ALR medium for, for a Zumwalt. And maybe we're, we're willing to trade a Zumwalt to go do this specific mission set um, based on, on the capabilities that it can bring to the fight. Awesome. Well, Anthony, we could go on. I, I, I actually had prepared even more questions for you, uh, but we're, we're running short on time here. This is a great conversation. Uh, I would uh, highly encourage our viewers and listeners to read this article, to read all the uh, American Sea Power uh, Project Phase 3 articles that are in the December issue. But this one is titled, sea, It's All About Sea Control, uh, which is just a, I, you know, I can put that on a bumper sticker. We can start, put it on, I might, might put it on some Naval Institute t-shirts this coming year. Uh, that, that's just a great, a great quote. Mahan and, and Nimitz would love it. Uh, as would uh, probably just about anybody who is a navalist. It's all about sea control. So thank you for writing for Proceedings. Thank you for your time today. And uh, good luck in your continued academic endeavor up there at the War College for this year. And we hope that you'll write for us again when you get into your uh, your XOCO tour. Yeah, thank, thanks very much, Bill, for, for having me. And to you and the, and the Proceedings team, thanks for, for uh, all the back and forth we did in the article and really trying to shape it the right way and, and get it to the point where uh, when people read it, they really see it as a, a, a really critical uh, thinking piece. And, and I really hope it's being passed around war rooms and ready rooms uh, and, and really causing people to stop and just think, do I need to think differently? Uh, and and if, if the answer is no, um, you know, maybe reread the article. Uh, but, but I really think we're at a point of uh, really needing some culture change and a, and a mindset shift uh, in, in our community to, uh, to really start working towards how, how do we uh, how do we unpack this uh, whether it's a Taiwan scenario or something else uh, how do we unpack this as warfighters and, and be um, you know as Admiral Aquilina would say uh, if deterrence fails be able to fight and win and I think that should be the mindset of of, of everyone out there. That's a great point and uh, I'll also just uh, remind folks I often say this but no one proceedings article is the alpha and the omega of the story right uh, it's really all about and this American sea power project has very much embodied this mindset which is we want to have the conversation this is a complex topic 
Uh, it's complex across the joint force. It's a complex across, you know, air and missile defense and, and surface warfare and undersea warfare and mine warfare, all the different, you know, domains, cyber, um, you know, C5, ISR, et cetera. Uh, and so it, this is in the, uh, in the magazine uh, and, and also in the, uh, uh, our articles about this is uh, just reminding folks we have an upcoming uh, essay contest called the Future Naval Warfare Essay Contest, which is part of this American Sea Power project. And so we're asking people to read the articles that have been written or commissioned for this series, like Anthony and, and uh, Scott's uh, article, read them and react to them in the essay contest. So the, the uh, due date for that essay contest is March 15th. Uh, first prize, $5,000. Second prize, $2,500. Third prize, like all our contests, $1,500. Uh, so look for that on our website. If you Google Proceedings uh, Essay Contest, you'll find our, our website. And you can also find the advertisement in the December and the January and the February issues of the magazine. Uh, so look to that essay contest prompt. And we want you to pitch into the fight here and be part of the conversation. So Anyway, all right, great conversation, Anthony. Appreciate your time. We uh, uh, just remind you that today's episode was brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute who support the open forum for those who dare to read, think, speak, and write about sea power. To become a member, go to usni.org forward slash join. We'll be on break now for a couple of weeks over Christmas and New Year's. So until 2024, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute. Happy holidays, everyone. And for our shipmates, fellow Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and Joint Service colleagues deployed around the world right now. Thanks for your selfless service and for standing the watch. Be safe out there.